Everybody, thank you all for showing up tonight. Um, you know, we, 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 the purpose of these talks are to just create value for people. You know, as, as, as federal employees, you know, just, you know, I want to provide you all the, and if everybody could turn their mics off, uh, I want to be able to provide you all the, the, the right amount of value so that you guys can retire on time and with confidence. And uh, last month when we did our conversation with uh, Cassandra, yeah. could y'all, could you mute, let, me, let me mute these people up. Could everybody mute their phone? Or that, and they're, they're uh, you come in, just mute yourself. But um, but I was saying so. So last month when we did this, we did a call with Cassandra. Cassandra's also a real estate investor. Um, you know, Robert was on that call, and Robert called me right after. He was like, "Hey, man, I do the same thing, <laughs> you know." And I, I would love to, I would love to create value for the community and tell them my story because I'm a federal employee just like them, and I also have properties, and so. And uh, and it was so funny. Right after you called me about that, other people were saying we need more of those type of calls. So it just made sense to put this together. And so what I'm going to do now is just introduce Robert to the group. Robert, um, you're a federal employee, right? Yes, I am. How many years have you been a federal employee? About three and a half years now. Okay. Okay. What What did you do before you were a federal employee? Well, I was a contractor for the FDA for about uh, ten years, actually. Oh. So okay. I was, yeah. So I was still indoctrinated in. The federal employee, but not necessarily as a federal employee, but just a federal government. Okay, so so being a contractor, you got that call one day. It's like, hey, we, we got some openings. You know, you want it? Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> you know, I I heard that you know the government was funding uh, the IRS uh, yeah. to uh, decommission a lot of their old servers, a lot of their old technology, and hire new people because there's a lot of people that were retiring. Yeah. So a friend of mine said, hey, look, you know, try this and see what happens. Yeah. And I fill out the application and three months later, they call me and here I am. Wow. OK. All right. So you so 10 years contractor, three years federal government. So total 13 years in the in the federal arena, so to speak. Yes. Yes. Um, now, when did you start investing in real estate? When we, what, what age were you and what, where were you at in life when you started? I would say about 25, I started around 25 and okay. um, I actually was introduced into real estate actually when I was uh, younger. I grew up in the Bronx okay. and my parents uh, bought a six unit apartment building in the South Bronx. And what my dad did was he was very handy. And, and so what he did was he did what is called sweat equity. So okay. with along with me going into the property and fixing it up himself on the weekends and after work. And I just saw the value of it where that six unit apartment building was able to pay for my, my myself and my siblings education. Wow. So when I didn't have, and, and I guess I was blessed, I didn't have any issues with financial aid and things like that going to college because my parents had a multi-unit apartment building that was generating uh, cash in order to pay for that. So when I came to Maryland and saw how the prices were significantly cheaper <laughs> than, than New York, yeah, I yeah. said, hey, why isn't anybody jumping on this? Yeah. Oh, so literally, uh, when about two years after I graduated from grad school, I had mm -hmm. a little bit of extra cash from my... Uh, financial aid when I went to uh, grad school and I took that money and used it as a down payment uh, for my first property. And I actually still have that first property. Was that, is that property in Maryland? DC area? Yes, it is. Yeah. Uh, it's in uh, Baltimore and it's on the right around the corner from John Hopkins University, not John Hopkins Hospital, John Hopkins University. And if oh, anybody wow. knows that area, are you familiar with uh, Memorial Stadium? Yep. Yep. Well, it's right on the same block where the Memorial Stadium. I remember talking to uh, a custodian where I used to work and he said, hey, look, you know, uh, uh, he said he was retiring so I to Florida. So, you know, me thinking, well, you're a custodian and he how are you able to afford all of this? He said, oh, have, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. I said, you know. He had he has properties. And I was yeah. like, oh, well, you know, that's what my parents do. He said, look, you need to start buying property because it will definitely uh, help you with your retirement. And you could just be like me when you're ready to retire. You won't have to worry about anything. So I got my first property at age uh, 26. 
And ever since then, I have bought and sold property for the last 20 years. I also... Hold on, Robert. Are you saying a lot of good stuff, but I don't want to miss it. If everybody could mute the phone real quick. Ray Ray Mays, uh, you could just mute your phone. But you said a lot of things that were were valuable, man. I want to touch first on um, your parents, right? So your parents from an early age taught you the blueprint of... Exactly. uh, Of of investing. Owning and and owning in a place that's not easy to own in, in, in New oh, York trust City. Me. You know what hey, I'm saying? So that alone is just like, why well, we always talk about generational wealth. And so your parents planted that seed of generational wealth in you from a young age. Yes. Yep. And their first clients, as I call them, yeah. were uh, uh, voucher recipients. Okay. So then I was introduced to what was Section 8 way back when and how it helped you know generate wealth from there. Awesome. So that that we're gonna get to that too. And so I love love that part, man. So your parents created that generational wealth seed in you, and you naturally, because once you plant that seed, you you programmed to go and do something similar. So you did. You went, you went like a heat seeking missile to find property because you that's the only thing you knew. And so and so I love that. And then you recognize opportunity in the DMV. Like you didn't you didn't buy in you I mean, New York. You didn't buy in DC. You bought you bought. Oh, no. multiple, but I, I should have. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you should have. But, but I, I wasn't familiar with the D.C. market, even though I know a lot of people at the time that I was investing bought yeah. property in D.C. and they're doing very well as well. But I, I stuck to what I knew. Yeah. And and that was the Baltimore market. And I actually worked in Baltimore. So it was just oh, easy for me sense. to just check on the properties, you know, after I get off work and things like that. And another thing you said, too, that I love is because a lot of people get those student loan. I know I got those student loan refund checks. I didn't know what to do with them. You know, exactly. what I'm saying? and so oh, I mean, I did know. I took them on spring break trips, and so, <laughs> and so, and so, um, and so for you, you took that money and you had the vision to say, "All right, I'm gonna take this money. I could spend it on whatever, but I'm gonna take it and reinvest it." And so, if you could just give an estimate, right? Like you took how how much how much thousands, and you turned it into what now, value wise? Would you, would you estimate? Sure. Way back when, and I can give you a perfect example. Way, my first property, I uh, that was about twenty years ago. I paid thirty four thousand in uh, for the property. Yeah. And I did what my father did. I did sweat equity. So after work, I would go. I would paint. I would do the rehab myself. I would ask a friend of mine who was a uh, carpenter to help me. And after the property was finished, I said to myself, there must be a better way to do this. And then I learned that, hey, look, my time is as valuable just as everybody else. So what I did for my next property, I was able to build in the rehab costs when I bought my next property so that all I'm doing is just checking on the property, acting as a GC or the project manager, making sure that everything is up to my par and I liking and then telling the contractor what I like and what I didn't like. And then I was able to kick out more properties that way. So when he was doing the work, I was still looking for other properties. Wow, man. And so, wow. So that 35000 a day is worth how much you think? Property is now worth 235000 Wow. So you took 35000 turned into 235000 Yes. And it helped me tremendously over the years because what I was able to do and what I like people to understand from this is real estate is one of the best vehicles you can use to leverage what you want. What I mean by leverage is real estate creates equity. So you're able to go in, pull some of that cash out and use it as a down payment, get another property and just wash, rinse, repeat. Wow. Wow. So that's beautiful, man. And then another thing that you uh, you mentioned was you 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 didn't judge the custodian, right? It's no, I didn't off, it's because right off people. You exactly. Ex- my first quote uh, after he told me that my next question to him was, "How do you do it? Where do I look? <laughs> how can I get to where you're? You are going to you know right. Right humble now. yourself, right? Exactly. And so, exactly. And so, at what age do you think that custodian was that allowed him to retire at that early age? Uh, he did retire early, so I would say probably uh, if he wasn't uh, 60, probably, probably about 60, because okay. he said that he was just going down to Florida. He uh, he didn't have to worry about uh, paying the mortgage, and all he wanted to do was play golf. Wow, wow. And that's exactly what I want to do. Not necessarily <laughs> play golf, but I, I want to be the guy at the bar just chilling and not have to worry about expenses. So... All right. And so I, I think everybody on this phone, maybe not at the bar, maybe not golf, maybe not Florida, but everybody at this 
on this call is probably on this call because they want some level of ease around their life the older they get and basically have life uh uh, live life on their own terms, basically. Oh, absolutely. And you don't even have to think of terms of, well, the, you always have to have an end goal. But what I tell people is just buy one property because it's amazing how that one property can change your lifestyle. I read a long time ago that, you know, the average household is only $400 away from you know, being broke. And you and I uh, both know, and I'm sure you talk to many people where they're living from paycheck to paycheck. So imagine what an extra five, six, seven hundred dollars a month coming into the household can do. Yeah, yeah. And the tax advantage that you get with owning a property. Yeah. Exactly, and we'll get into that too. And so the question I have for you, because everybody's at that same place and they want to do it, how did you? I know you got the first property, but as somebody that's working a nine to five job, you have kids, right? Right. I'm, yeah, yeah I don't have any kids. Gift. Okay. All right. Well, still, as a person working a nine to five job, how did you? You know put your money aside or whatever to be able to invest in real estate and continue to build property. Like how, how would you invest? How would you advise somebody, the people that's on this call to do that? Well, right now the market has changed significantly okay. and the market is it's always changing. And I've always been asked this question too, because I also do podcasts for the Maryland real estate association as well. And I always get this question. So there's a number, there's a number of uh, things you can do. Number one, you know, when you go and you to a lender, the first thing going to ask you is, do you have 10 to 20 percent down? Yeah. You know, if you're looking at a hundred thousand dollar property, you know, that's ten thousand dollars. If they want 15 percent down, that's fifteen thousand plus closing costs. So what I tell people is, one, I know Cassandra talked about not taking money out of your TSP because uh, she didn't feel that comfortable about it. But what I tell people is that, you know. If you take money out of your TSP, you're paying yourself back. So if you pay yourself back with a TSP, let's say right now the average uh, interest on a TSP is about, what, two and a half percent or something like that. You yeah, know, they, they base it off the G fund. Exactly. Like between one and so two. Yeah. let's just say you take out $10,000 from your TSP as a loan, as a down payment. When you refinance that property, of course, you're bringing the property up to what is called market value, the ARP, the average um, uh, prop the average price for that property if you were to sell it on the market. Yeah. You refinance, you take that money back, you pay back your TSP, and now you have a generate uh, uh, well a cash flowing property that's able to help you through your monthly expenses. Have you done a deal like that before? All the time. So, can you walk us through? Cause you just did it in high level. Can you walk us through an example? If, if that's okay with you, like, like I took, okay. I, I took 50,000 out and then I like, just walk us through. Cause there's people on the call with lots of money in their TFP. Right. Right. But they just so, don't know how. So just, if you could walk them through the deal flow, how you act exactly did it. Sure. So I found Say I found a property, uh, let's say for 80,000. Okay. So the average cost of closing costs is going to be about 5% of that. So what I was able to do was I found a lender. And most people, the first thing that they think of lender, they think of PNC, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, and, and things like that. That is a no-no. Unless you have a good relationship with those banks, I would say go to your smaller banks. They're able to work with you better and you get a better rate than if you would go, go to the bigger banks. Because the bigger banks... They, they'll help you, but it's a lot of fees involved. If you belong to a credit union, that's one of the best places to go. If your credit union doesn't work for you, you can Google private money lenders. You can Google hard money lenders. They will uh, help you out as well. And I'm going to get into the interest rate and hard money lenders and things like that. But you buy, uh, you find a property, let's say for 80000 I went into I saw that I had money in my TSP. So what I was able to do was find out how much my lender, which was the credit union, required for a down payment. So let's just say it was fifteen thousand uh dollars. -huh. So what I was able to do was get take out that fifteen thousand dollars, and at the time it was I think one point seven five percent on that fifteen thousand dollars. Then I used that uh, as a down payment, bought the property, and then what I was able also to do, you can also Google renovations loan, and what that is also uh, is is a piggyback loan with 
the loan that you have in order to fix up the uh, property because a lot of the properties that you're buying, you're going to buy them at, at, at a distressed property. <laughs> you know, you can, you can buy a retail property, but why would you? The whole purpose is to uh, create equity with these properties. So I should definitely suggest a property that, quote unquote, needs a little bit of TLC. I like to call it lipstick on a pig. A lot of people say, well, I don't want to deal with contractors and, and having to do big renovations and stuff like that. You don't have to. You can find properties where you can change the carpet, paint, maybe you know update the kitchen, the bathroom, and you're good to go. Okay. So once you bring it up to market value, you can actually go back to that lender or any lender now and say, hey, look, this $80,000 property that I have is now worth $150,000. Wow. I would like to refinance this property and pull cash out. So what most lenders will do, they'll give you what is called 80% of the uh, value of the property. So that so if the property is $150,000, they're going to give you a loan for 80% of that or 75% of that. So of course, 75% or 80 of that will cover the cost that you pay for the property. You'll get your money back and you'll get a little extra money in your, uh, uh, in your pocket as well. And you say your money back, right? The 15,000 that you took out of your TSP. Yes. And so what you, you did in your case is you, you, the 15,000 you got from the TSP, you put that money right back into the TSP. I, I put, I put that money right back until I could find another property. <laughs> okay. And so how long was that turnaround time for you from the one, taking the money out and putting it back into the TSP? So the TSP, when I took it out, probably about five to seven days, if that, I would even say that long, maybe five days. Oh, before and you put then, it back? Oh, no, 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 no. Oh, from, from, um, from start to finish. So yeah. getting the property, it's going to be about uh, 30 to 40 days um, yeah. for closing. Yeah. Fix up the property. It's probably about a good, may, I must say, say 60 days. Most contractors say, oh, I can do this property in, in, in six weeks. Oh, Oh, if you guys watch uh, HGTV, you know that something will always go wrong. Murphy's mm -hmm. Law. So mm -hmm. I always count on uh, whenever they tell me six to uh, eight weeks, I always add another three weeks to that because something mm -hmm. will go wrong. So I would say maybe about 60 days after I, I find the property and then refinance it will be about another 30 days and you have your, and you have so your money. Six, so, so you're talking six, 60 to 90 days max. Money right back in there. And then you coming out with a profit is what you're saying. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. And it's just like you said, rinse, wash, repeat. Exactly. Right? Awesome. Exactly. Once you do it once, you realize that, hey, it's not as bad as I thought. And then you get the bug and you continue to do it over and over again. So that's awesome, man. Look at the smile on his face. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so that leads me to that next question. So you get the properties now. So you, you were talking to me before the call. You were talking about how you love Section 8, right? Yes. You talk about why you love Section 8 and what yes. does it mean and, and put it in the context of, and what it means for your retirement. Like why you love Section 8 and what it means for your retirement. So Section 8, um, the misconception that Section 8 is, is that uh, Section 8 recipients or clients, they're going to destroy your property. That is right. not true. Uh, 20 years of doing it, I have yet to have a tenant actually totally destroy my property. Actually, my longest tenant uh, I have is 11 years now. The one before that is 10 years and the one before that is seven years. So you have long-term tenants that are in your property and the government is paying you the first of the month, every single month, rain, sleet, shine, pandemic, no matter what, you will be paid. Okay. And what does that mean for your retirement? Like for somebody that's saying, they want to be able to, they want to invest in real estate and retire on the money that they're making. Like, what does that mean for them? Well, for me, it means that later on in my, uh, for my retirement, I have a cash generating asset that in my retirement years, that's still going to generate income for me. Now, one thing about Section 8 is that every year you can increase the rent anywhere from 5 to 10%. Okay. So when you retire, everybody knows that you're earning less than what your average salary is. But for me, having a, a property that uh, has Section 8 clients, I'm still increasing my, I'm still getting cash flow. And every year I'm actually increasing it to 5% um, raising the rent. Wow. 
Wow, man. And so, so what you're saying is, you know, you're going to have your first pension, you're going to have your TSP, you're going to have your Social Security, but you're also going to have seven other checks, which is... Uh, absolutely. <laughs> uh, actually, eight if, if, if it goes well. With oh, one you got one in the pipeline right now? Yeah, I got one in the pipeline, yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's great, man. Um, the next question I want to ask is, um, you mentioned, um, oh, well, no, are all your properties in the DMV or you have them spread out? And what do you I, have, I have I recently have one in Florida, um, and that's a short term rental that you and I talked about. But yes, um, the the others are in the DMV area. Okay, okay. Um, what I want to do now, I want to. Is there anything I didn't ask you that you want to address real quick? Because I want to open up the Q and A because that's where the most value gets comes from people. Um, uh, sure. Well, one of the things people always ask me is, well, you know, what properties are good for Section Eight? Okay. And I always tell I always tell them. As long as it's listed as a habitable home, yeah, it's good for Section Eight. Okay. You can uh, you can have any property as Section Eight. The key to that is figuring out what your mortgage is and what Section Eight will pay. Now, uh, mm-hmm. one of the thing, one of the things that I have learned is that you know when you find a property and you want to rent it to Section Eight, the best thing is ask your realtor to give you comparables to what is being rented within the area. And that will give you a general idea of what your rents are going to be for that particular property. And you want to give that information to housing as well, because housing will come back and say, well, we're only going to give you $1,200 for this property. And you say, well, wait a minute, the house down the block is very comparable with the same square footage and they're renting for $1,500. So I, I would like the same amount and they will match it for you. Wow. So they, so the government's going to look at the conference and say, we're going to match what's there. No matter. Mm-hmm. That's give, a you, uh, give you something cl- close to it. Now I have property uh, uh, clients where their section eight is paying 100% of the rent. Wow. And, but the general is they pay 80 and the tenants pay 20%. Okay. So I literally have somebody paying sixty-seven dollars a month. <laughs> what happens if they don't give you sixty-seven? Do you do you just not sweat it and be like, okay? Oh no, no, I asked for the sixty-seven. <laughs> <laughs> I and mean, it's, you, you have to treat it as a business for sure, Trust for me. sure, for sure, for sure. And so, how early do you think this will allow you to retire, having properties like this in your mind? Uh, well, it, it depends. What, what it actually provides for me is ease that if I want to retire early. I yeah. can because I have gen- generating assets or yeah. if I want to stick it out till I'm 65 and just max out my retirement, I still can do that. So the option is up to me, but it yeah. takes away the guessing game of, yeah. you know, I have to stay in this job another five, six years because, you know, I don't have enough to retire. Uh, yeah. I, I'm, I would like to say that I don't have to do that. Right, right, right. You, you control your own destiny, so to speak. Absolutely. Awesome. So what I want to do now is I want to open up. If you have any questions, just if you have any questions, raise your hand. Um, just if y'all know how to do that or just unmute yourself and 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 uh, and speak if you have a question for, for, for Robert. Does anybody have any questions? Yes. Hi, this is uh, Greg. Quick question. Hey, Greg. Hey, All right, uh, Robert. When you were when you were looking at properties, uh, did you look at multi unit properties or single family uh, properties? Like, how did you know which kind of property to go after? Well, it depends on your preference. For me, I actually looked at both. I'm actually I'm going to look into multi family units as well. For me, uh, finding single family homes were easier because at the time they were plentiful. But it really all depends on you know, what your preference is. I know people that only look at multifamily units and they have two and three and pretty much they said they're done because they're able to generate enough cash flow where they don't have to sweat it. So it really all depends on what your preference is. But, you know, with any portfolio, it's always good to have a mix. Is that good, Greg? I know, yeah, I know a lot of people that do multifamily. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, I know a lot of people that focus on multi, And most people that I talk to, they're like, they don't have any property, but they're like, I want to get into multifamily. Like, that's the first thing. Do you think that's a big jump from going from no property to jumping into multifamily because it sounds good? Like, what do you think about that? 
I, I would always uh, suggest that you start off with a single family first okay. because it'll teach you the ins and out of just owning a, an investment property, wh what you have to do as far as getting it ready. I mean, with a multifamily, if you jump off and not knowing exactly, you know, being a novice investor, now you're dealing with a five or six unit and that's five or six units that you have to renovate uh, yeah. in order to get ready. But if you have that one, you'll know what you have to do as far as cost is concerned, uh, how dealing with contractors, dealing with uh, permitting, things like that. And permitting is not that bad. And what I suggest for most people too is always find a, con a licensed bonded contractor. I've had some uh, run-ins where some uh, contracts were just handyman and the work wasn't up to par, but always find a licensed bonded contractor and ask for reference for the, for the, uh, the contractor. If he's a good contractor, he has n he or she has no problem actually giving you reference and you can um, see what they're all about, but always get a license because uh, they will be able to pull permits and things like that for you. Okay. That's a good point. Man. Um, Chuck. Yes, sir. Good evening. Yeah, what's going on, brother? How you doing? Good. Yeah, I have a question for Mr. Rob. How you doing, Mr. Rob? Sure. Good. Would you, what is your take on vacation properties and short-term rentals like Furnish Finder for travel nurses? Because I've been told that you can get more of a return during the month because the short-term rentals, you can charge a little bit more for like Airbnb, VBRO, and then Furnish Finder, you yeah, I mean, yeah, Section 8 also is guaranteed, but also furnished fine because I've heard that travel nurse companies pay you directly. So what is your take on that? Absolutely. My take is do it. I mean, I have a short term rental right now in Florida and definitely that's a big market as well. Do it wherever you can find uh, a and create an asset. Definitely do it. See, the market has expanded so much that with real estate, you can pretty much do anything. You know, one of the things that you have to realize with being an investor is you're, you're adding value uh, and you're giving value to something. So if you can find a property and rent it out to traveling nurses and it's generating an income from you, by all means, do it. Uh, thank you very much. And so and what, what do you think about the... Uh this because short term rentals is kind of relatively new, right? Yes, so, it is. But it's to me, it seems more profitable. Is it? Is it? Is it more profitable than so far? Is it? It, it depends. And it, one uh, with short term rentals and Airbnb, of course, it's all based on location. And what people don't realize with Airbnb is that they take a large chunk of the money as well. There are some companies out there that will do it for you, okay. but they're charging anywhere to twenty to thirty percent of what you're bringing in. So. If you're renting out, say for a thousand dollars, automatically right off the bat, they're taking twenty to thirty percent, and then you have to pay for the other fees on top of that. So you have to charge enough in order to make a profit. And what people you have to charge, and you can also charge for cleaning and things like that, which the uh, short-term uh, renter is going to pay. But you just have to lay it out on a spreadsheet to see exactly how much money that you're bringing in. Um, one of the things I've done over the years is help people uh, get uh, property as well. And one guy had told me, you know, all I want to do is just make a $200 profit. For me, that's not enough because, you know, things will go wrong no matter what. You can have the best renter and that renter will definitely keep your property immaculate. But the roof will sometimes leak. The furnace will go out. Appliances will break down. And, you know, you have to have enough in your quote unquote kitty to do that. The best way to do that is I would tell people because the people say, well, I don't want to deal with it. People call me late at night, you know, saying that my toilet is clogged. I don't do it. I don't deal with that either. What I do is I get I found a property manager that's only charging one hundred dollars per door, meaning only one hundred dollars per property. Yeah. And they handle all of that. I also have warranties, which is relatively new on the property. You know, I know um, a bg &E has a warranty where they'll come in and uh, quote unquote certify your appliances for you, uh, or you can buy a homeowner's warranty. So if anything breaks down, you pay deductible, say $50, and they'll come in and fix it. For instance, I just had a um, home serve um, which you can just look it up. Homeserve.com will take care of appliances, furnace, um, uh, your electrical and your plumbing. So one of my furnace just went out a couple of weeks ago and the motor went. 
And I called up the home serve and I didn't have to pay a deductible for home serve. They came out. They said, you're going to need a new motor. So I said, well, how much is that going to cost? He said, well, if you if I was to do it or uh, and you would pay out of your pocket, you're looking about seven hundred and fifty dollars. But home serve was able to cover that cost. And I paid zero out of pocket. Zero. Zero. <laughs> also, you know, a um, couple of times, you know, my property manager would say, hey, look, you know, tenant called and said that the toilet is backed up or the tub is backed up. I tell them, call home serve. They came out. They snaked it. I mean, I know some plumbers are charging $400 just to snake out your drain because I know a couple of plumbers that are doing that. And that's relatively cheap. Yeah. I paid zero out of pocket. But you pay, a, then, monthly, you pay a monthly subscription fee or something like that to this. Right? Yes. For the plumbing, believe it or not, $12 a month. Oh, wow. Homeserve.com, $12 a month. And you can go to BG&E uh, Home and look up well, what they have as far as the warranty policy as well. Wow, that's good information, man. So homeserve.com. So yes. another question I have, um, and if anybody else has a question, please raise your hand and I'll, and I'll unmute you and you can ask it. But the question I have for you is, as, early, as people starting out in real estate, what is, what's one of the biggest mistakes you've made where it was like, damn, that was costly. And like, never, I'll never do it again. Is, is there any story you have where, where that something like that happened to you? Getting caught up in the hype of owning a property. And what I mean is, you know, People see a property or they see friends owning property and if they don't take the time to actually talk to the investor and say, hey, look, I'm interested in owning property. Let me know. Uh, can you tell me exactly what you went to? All they see is the end product where they're collecting checks. But there are a lot of steps that go along with owning that property. So what uh, new investors do, they go out, they see a property that they like. And they say, well, you know, uh, I'm going to buy this property and end up spending more money for the property than they thought. They say, OK, well, this property is, you know, they're selling it for 150, but the market value is 150. They go in there and they want to gold plate everything. They want to put granite on in, in the kitchen. They want to, the new um, tiles and end up spending more money than what the property. So now. They've over improved the property and they can't get their money back from that. And I've seen it all the time. Wow. So my suggestion to most people is look for a property that doesn't require that much work. And there's there's property out there. I don't buy retail because retail doesn't work for me. You know, just like I don't buy brand new cars. They said the minute you drive off of a, uh, the lot, it depreciates 20 percent. But. If I, if I bought something certified that's two or three years, I'll get more value out of that car. Plus, my monthly expense for that property is not as much as if I bought that brand new car. Oh, wow. Wow. Um, does, that's a lot of great information, man. Um, does anybody else have a question for Robert? And while we wait to see if somebody does. So what's a good, you said you don't buy anything retail. So what's a good, what's your, what's a good ratio for you when you're looking for property and how do you find those properties? Well, I, when I find a property, um, because I know that the lender is only going to give me 75 to 80% of uh, the market value of the property, I do what is called the Mayo uh, um, uh, system. Basically what the Mayo system is, I, if the property is uh, worth $100,000 after fix up, I, I reverse engineer that. So I say, okay, I'm going to get a loan value of 80%. And what is it going to cost me to fix up this property? If it's going to cost me about $15,000, then I subtract $15,000 from that 80%. And yeah. then that is my bottom line of what I would pay for that property. So if, if it's $100,000, yeah. And I know that the bank is going to give me eighty eighty thousand dollars, and yeah. it's going to cost me say ten thousand um, to fix it up. I know that the the top amount that I'm going to pay for that property is seventy. So yeah. if you're paying fifty thousand for the property, that extra twenty thousand is just money that's going to put into your pocket after you refinance the property. Wow. So so seventy percent is your, so seventy to eighty is your is your range. Correct. And then where do of, you find of the market value? Well, oh, they're all they're all over. You know, you can uh, if you have a, a realtor, you can tell the realtor, hey, look, I'm looking properties that need, need to be TLC fix up 
or, or even HUD properties. You can look at, you can look up Fannie Mae properties. You can put in all of this, um, Google it, and you will find all of this information. Or what I do is I have two or three realtors and I say, hey, look, you know, I'm an investor and I'm looking for properties. Can you put me on your list? Uh, these are the exact zip codes that I'm looking for. And this is the top uh, amount that I want to pay for the properties. Or if you're not ready to talk to a realtor, you can subscribe to Zillow. You can subscribe to realtor.com. You can subscribe to Redfin and put in all your criteria of what you want. And either daily, weekly, or monthly, all those properties that in the area that you set will come to your email. And then you can drive by the property, see if you like it, and if you do like it, call up the realtor, say, hey, I'm interested in this property. First thing they're going to say is, are you pre-approved? And I would definitely suggest that you get pre-approved when you speak to a, a realtor. And after you pre approve it just starts the process. Awesome. That's when you go to the CSP and get the money to, to use. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, Chuck, you got another question? I did. Thank you, Will. So what is yeah. your take on... Um, tax liens and or um uh since one more thing i was trying to think of tax liens or in short sales for getting properties like deals for properties uh, i have bought property on short sales um because of the pandemic is taking longer so you know short sales usually it has to touch many different hands to sign off in order to sell it so if i was to find a property and it would close in 30 to 45 days usually a short sale is you going to take usually 60s? I even know people that uh, are waiting on a prop, um, short sales that is taking them four months to approve. But if you can wait and you know the property is good, that's just money that's going to be in your pro in, in your pocket. So it all depends on what you how long you're willing to wait. But definitely short sales are good. Tax liens usually when you find you find a tax lien, it depends on what the tax lien is. And with the tax lien in Maryland, you know, if they want to redeem the property, they'll, whatever you pay for the property, they'll pay you back 18% on, on top of that, depending on the county or the city that, that you're in. But sometimes, you know, usually, you know, if you paid $5,000 for a property and there's a mortgage on, on the property and the mortgage is worth $100,000, no bank is going to let the property go for $5,000. So what ends up happening is the bank will step in pay you your $5,000 plus the 18% on that and what are the fees that you incur and you just do it all over again. Okay, so they're not going to wipe out that debt then, even if they don't redeem it. It, it. it depends on the bank too. If it's a smaller bank and they just don't care, they might just wipe it out. But, you know, a lot of these smaller banks are being gobbled up by the bigger banks. So you might have like... Um, uh, you know, first federal, you know, and might have a, pro uh, you know, a property. Hold on, hold on. Hmm? You mute your phone. If you're not Robert or Chuck, you can mute your phone. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. So, you know, a first federal might own a pro uh, own, own, hold a mortgage to that property, and you had bought the pro property at the tax lien for 5000 So, f first federal might say, you know what? It's just not worth us going through the property and uh, redeeming the property. And you might look out and get that property for 5000 I have heard people that bought a tax lien for 25000 waited uh, close to eight months and got a 25000 well, got, got a property for 25000 and is actually worth about 100000 So they go in, they do what they do, either they rent it out or they actually wholesale it. I know some people that said, okay, well, I got this property for 25. I don't feel like doing the work, but I know that the equity is there. Let me just put it back on the, on the MLS or wholesale it. And whatever you can wholesale it for, that's back in your pocket. Oh, you can do what is assignment of contract. But next month we can get into that. <laughs> <laughs> that's a whole conversation. That's a whole conversation. <laughs> yeah, Chuck, is that, 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 that clear, clear that for you, man? It does. Thank you. I'll have a TSP question later. I don't want to. Oh, no. Go ahead and ask it since you're on. Let me, let me, add, oh, let me okay. add. Oh, oh yeah, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, let yeah, me, yeah, let yeah, me yeah, get the. Wait, I ask the question. I'll get to Christina's question next. Oh, so as far as your TSP, I know there's like two, 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 there's two tiers. There's from what I understand. There's the um, residential loan if you're buying a house. 
and right. then there's there like the the no the no doc loan where it, it doesn't pull your credit. It's like a percentage. But what if that doesn't cover the whole um um and the whole down payment? Doesn't it depend on how much is currently in your TSP? Well, uh, yes. So TSP will only give you half of whatever is in your TSP. And TS and you're talking about what is called a general purpose loan. So yes, you can get right. a general purpose loan from your TSP and it's only going to give half of what's in there. So what I also suggest, and I've done this before, is I've gone to places like uh, One Main Financial and I've gotten a personal loan or you could go to, again, your credit union and ask for a personal loan and uh, make up the difference. Now, the difference between the personal loan from, the, like say a one main financial bank and your uh, credit union is that the credit union will probably give you anywhere from maybe six to as high as maybe 10, 11% on your personal loan versus one main financial, you're looking at maybe 15 to 16%. But remember the whole purpose is for you to fix up that property um, refinance it and pay it back. Because once you do that a couple of times, now you're showing that, you know, you're able to pay back loans, which would increase your credit score, which will bring down the interest rate that they're going to charge you. Got it. Thank you. So, thank you. so, so Robert, so, you, so what I'm hearing is like, you need to have a relationship with a smaller bank when you're doing this. If you're going to yes. Be doing it, yes. Yeah. And, and I always go in and like I said, I go and talk to the bank manager or one of the lenders and say, hey, look, you know, what is your programs as far as buying investment properties? And um, what I told uh, Signal Financial is one of my credit unions. You know, he's uh, first thing he says, uh, and they're out in Kensington, Maryland. He said, we don't uh, we don't lend uh, property in Maryland uh, uh, money from it. And I said, well, why? And he said, well, we're just not familiar with that. And I said, well, what if I put something together to show you that it's, it will be worth your while? And he said, okay, fine. So I put a whole spreadsheet together of how much a property is worth, the comps, what uh, Section 8 was going to pay me, you know, uh, my contractor's information, when, when I will be finished. When he saw that, he was impressed because nobody else was doing that. And I have three properties under that uh, credit union as, as right now. So you open the gates for all of us. Yeah, I, actually, yeah, because now, <laughs> now, they're, now they're starting to lend in Maryland. I mean, in Baltimore, Look at you. <laughs> Look at you. <laughs> yes. Um, that, but that goes right into the question that Christina asked me privately. She asked, uh, did you discuss how much money you need to have saved up to start doing investment property? And, and that goes back to, it depends on the property that you're looking at. So, you know, of course, Baltimore properties are much cheaper than they are in Upper Marlboro. So, you know, you have to say to yourself, okay, if I'm looking at, well, right now, properties in Upper Marlboro, you know, if you're looking at a, a, a townhouse in Upper Marlboro, you're looking at what, 220, um, close to 300,000. That's a little high right now. But if you think about it, on a $300,000 uh, uh, property at the rates that we have right now, you're looking close to at a 30 year fix. You're, look, you're looking close to being fifteen thousand dollars a month. So yeah. I mean fifteen hundred a month. So you have to ask yourself: if my mortgage is fifteen hundred dollars a month, how much can I rent that property for? And that's where the uh, your realtor will come in to pull the comps to see. So right now, I'll give you a perfect example. You know, right here in Columbia. Uh, you know, properties are astronomical, um, but there are a few townhouses that you can get for like, say, 250000 But rents are high in Columbia. So for a three bedroom, two bath right now, uh, you're looking at twenty six, twenty seven hundred dollars $2,700 a month. So if I get a property for 250000 knowing that my mortgage is going to be $2,400 a month and rents are $2,500, i am bringing in $1,000 a month. That's an Right, right. If you can get the property. If you can get the property, exactly. <laughs> if you can get the property, because a lot of people are going to be bidding on that property. Absolutely. Um, does anybody else have a question? Mm -hmm. If you have a question, just unmute yourself and ask the question. And, and Christina, did that answer your question? Because you, you don't want to really ask that question. Yeah, it answered it. Thanks. It did? Okay, good. Mm -hmm. All right. I have a question. Okay. Yes. Um, do you uh, have an LLC or 
is everything under your name. Um, I know I have some uh, friends who put every 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 property has its own LLC. So do you kind of do that or, you know, what's your strategy with that? Or your I, earlier when I started, the property was in my personal name and the rest are the other properties are in my LLC. So if you have an LLC for every single property, your account is going to love you because the forms that he has to, or he or she has to file for the LLC, he's going to charge you for each form. So what some people have done is form an LLC and maybe put two or three within that LLC and so on and so on. So that will put down on the people and the expense that uh, your account is going to charge you. So you might think about it that way. But if you're okay putting it each property in an LLC, by all means do it. And the whole purpose of the LLC is to limit the liability for each property. That's a great question, Greg. And, it's it's and, 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 and to follow up with that, so when you're going to the bank to get the refi, it's under your LLC and not your name. Is that right? Correct. They, they, they're going to require a, little, um, a lot more paperwork for the LLC, meaning the articles of incorporation and things like that. But once you file an LLC, you should have all of that already. And that's where when you go into the bank, you're going to ask for what is called a portfolio loan. And the best thing about a portfolio loan is this. And, I'm, and I want to stress this with everybody. Whenever you buy property in your personal name, you're using your personal credit. But the, the trick, and what most people don't realize is, if you don't have an LLC, you can still go to the bank and ask them if you can get a commercial loan for a single family property as an investor. Yes, there are some banks that will do that. And the best thing about that is once you get a personal, uh, well, a, a commercial loan, it does not report to your credit report. You probably will have to guarantee that loan which is fine, but it won't report to your personal credit. I have, like I said, I have seven properties and four of the properties I have commercial loan on them and they do not report to my um, credit report. And why is that a good thing? Well, it's a good thing because it, it frees you up uh, as far as if you want to go and get more property. Yep. A lot of the banks will cap you at four or five properties or depending if the, the how the bank is. But if you go in there and say, hey, look, I want a commercial loan. You're now, you, in their eyes, you're a legitimate business. Therefore, you already have property in a, a commercial property, of, so a commercial loan. So they're saying you've done your due diligence to, to show us that are uh, less of a risk because you have other commercial loans. We will lend you the money because somebody else took out that risk already on you. Greg, does that answer your question, man? Yeah, yeah, you gave me a lot. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. It did answer my question. I hope I didn't give you too much. <laughs> well, you did. And actually, I was going to ask you if uh, you do any mentoring or anything like that, because uh, you got a lot of, you know, rookies, me being one of them, who can use some guidance in this. So, um, you know, you know what? Uh, I, I've, yeah. I've been asked that a lot because I also, like I said, I also do podcasts as well for that. And, you know, I, and it's funny because I, I always feel funny you know, charging for that because for me, information is free. So it should be freely given. So what I can do for you, if you have any questions or so, you can either email uh, William and ask whatever questions or, uh, you know, William and I can just talk and your, I can give you. Email, man. Just put your email in the chat, y'all. Like, oh. oh, yeah. I can put it in and then whatever, whatever question you have. I, I, get, I get questions <laughs> every single day. I tell people get properties. Um, a friend of mine, you know, a couple of years ago, she works for uh, the CDFI fund, which is a subsidiary of uh, Treasury. And I was telling her, hey, look, you need to get a property. You need to get a property because she was being taxed heavily. So I was able to help her get a property and the property uh, and I got the contractor for her and the property was generating so much income. So what I told her to do is forget the 30 year fix refinance this and put it into a 15-year mortgage. So she's on track right now to uh, the paying off that property. Uh, I think five, six years from now, the property will be paid off and she's nowhere near retirement. So she will be generating cash flow of $1,500 a month until she retires. Wow. Wow. 
Hey, Robert, you picked a great mentor. I mean, not Robert. Well, great, great. great mentor. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, got, I, got, I got one more question for you, and I'm going to sure. leave you alone after this. Um, sure. Do you factor in vacancy rates or, or let me back up? Have you ever had to evict somebody? What's that process like for you? And do you account for uh, vacancy rates um, when you're in your rental business? Uh, yes, I did have to evict somebody um, one time. That's only because, you know, it, they were doing something a little shady. Uh, they were stealing electricity from bg um, Section 8 found out and actually terminated the contract. So I had to actually um, uh, evict her. And what I found was going down to the courthouse and doing all of that stuff is a pain in the butt. So, you know, they're saying let experts do what they're supposed to do. So I do have a lawyer who doesn't charge me anything. I just say, hey, look, you know what? This is how much money is owed. And um, can you file all the paperwork? And she takes one third of that. Or you can, uh, there's a company called uh, Maryland Rent Courts, which are significantly cheaper than actually going to a lawyer. And that's all they handle is filing the paperwork for you, going to court and getting your money. So, and then what I also do, you know, do is once they um, file it, get a judgment, they also follow up with garnishing their wages, garnishing their bank accounts. So you will get your money. Wow, man. Wow. Um, Robert, they need, uh, they need, you. need your email in the, in, in, the, in the chat, man. So if you could put your email in the oh. chat. Sure, no and, problem. And, and just you, FYI, I'm coming from. I'm calling from Philly, Philadelphia. So <laughs> you know, I, I hear some Giants and some Raider uh, Ravens fans over there. So yeah, <laughs> just throwing it out there. Uh, <laughs> and, and you know, and you know, the Philly market is very similar to the Baltimore market. Wow. Um, hold on, oh yeah, one. yeah. Lots of lots of gentrification going on right now in Philly. So it's a lot of opportunities out there, and I just want to jump in that a little deeper. Exactly. And I have uh, two under my belt right now. Good, two. good. All right, well, so, uh, Miss Powell, you, is, you, you have the floor now. You have, you have your hand raised. Okay, yeah. I just wanted to ask him, ask um, Rob if he uh, uh, has worked with uh, auctions. Like, have you ever gone to an auction and bought a home? Uh, Miss Powell, you, you're right up my alley. I actually just went to look at three properties today that I'm going to the auction tomorrow. So, yes, um, one of the things with, with auction and that a lot of people are afraid of, and I actually I was a little hesitant myself because with the properties, you know, you can't view the properties inside. Sometimes they might have people in there. And I did buy a property from an auction and, and I did have to uh, file what is, what is called a holdover where they wouldn't leave. It wasn't bad, but what I was able to do was they knew that the property was being foreclosed on. They knew the auction date and it was just coming. They were just waiting to see what was going on. So I went to, after I won the bid, I went to them and I said, hey, look, you know, there's two ways we can handle this. One, we can go to court and the judge is going to say, you need to leave at a certain date uh, and then you get none. Or here's $500 for you to leave at a set time or a set date. And then uh, as long as the property is left intact, and you give me the keys, I will meet you someplace and give you, you know, the what is called cash for keys. Works every time. So can you can you like give it like a step by step process for how the auction thing works? Because I know that some of them they'll say like you have to put down a certain amount, like a deposit or something. I guess so they'll know that you mean business or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then right. you know, I mean, can like you have you ever been to one where? No one shows up at the auction and it's automatically yours or, you know what I mean? It's, it's never automatically yours. And yes, I've been to one uh, two weeks ago and I'm actually kicking myself because I should have um, bid on the property because I, there was four people at the, at the auction and I was actually looking at um, two properties and um, nobody bid on the property. So it went to what is called, it went back to the bank for what was owed. So uh, they ask for, they usually ask for 10% of what's owed on the property. So let's just throw a number out and just say 50,000. So they ask mm -hmm. for 
five uh, dollars $5, as a deposit. Within five, uh, depending on the auction house, they might require you to give another deposit within ten to fifteen days. And again, that all depends on which auction house it is. If not, then you have thirty to sixty days in order to come up with the cash. And you have to wait until the judge ratifies the contract, meaning that he checks out everything, everything is good, and now the property, you can now go to closing. So uh, you pay the $5,000, let's say 30, 60 days later, the judge says, oh, you get a, a, a call or email or a letter saying that the judge ratified the contract, it's now yours. Now you have to go to um, uh, closing with that property. So you do have to come up with cash for it. I have yet to find a company that will lend money on an auction, but here's a, um, a way around that. Wow. If, the, if the property is vacant, mm -hmm. what you can do 30 days after you win the bid, the property is yours. So if you're able to get, get access to inside the property, you now can use what is called a hard money lender to go in and say, hey, look, I'm probably going to go to closing within the next few weeks. Can you lend me money on this property to fix it up? So the pro so most hard money lenders will give you the property, either 90 or some, depending on your credit, 100% of the fix up costs. And they'll give you uh, uh, maybe 90% of the purchase price as well. And usually um, the deposit that you put down uh, will cover that 90% of the, of the purchase price. Now, the thing with a hard money lender is it's not like a regular loan. So you can't, um, quote unquote, dilly dally with trying to fix up the property because time is of the essence. And they usually mm -hmm. charge double digits for uh, the interest rate. But you will find that even though they charge double digits interest rate, they'll probably only charge you interest and not principal on the money that they lend you. So if you Google hard, hard money lenders um, for investors, there's, I mean, the market is flooded right now with that. And I put my uh, email in there. I can give you a couple of uh, hard money lenders uh, that I have used where they only charge you uh, the interest rate. You go in, you fix the property, and they give, like I said, they give you the rehab costs. Once everything is done, um, you go to your credit union, you go to another lender, you refinance at a much lower interest rate, and you're good to go. Okay, so you don't see a, a, a big difference between buying one from an auction and just buying one through a real estate agent? or. Well, the big difference is, you know, a lot of these auctions are sight unseen. So what I did with the one that I'm looking for is I, di I didn't have access to, to go inside of the property. I actually looked through the windows look, um, and upstairs and looked in the, in the basement to see what I'm dealing with. And I generally know what my construction costs are. But I also look at other properties that have sold on that block. So usually if you find properties that are selling within uh, on that block, the uh, footprint is pretty much the same. So I look at what they, how they fix up theirs and I say, okay. And it's good because if I'm looking at properties that sold within that block, now I'm looking at what the average market price of that property is. So that will determine whether or not I'm going to bid on the property. But just starting out, you know, unless you can have access to go inside of that property and really know um, what the construction is, Right now, I would suggest, you know, wait a little bit until you get a, a little bit more familiar with buying uh, properties and knowing it before you actually go to the auction. But yep, I'm you, curious because I, I see them and I'm and it just it looks discouraging. It's just like, <laughs> oh, no, uh, you know, it, it's just it's just another step within real estate. What I would like to tell people is, you know, if somebody else is doing it, there's no reason why you guys can't do it either. I mean, it just takes education. And then, mm -hmm. you know we all are in a professional position where we're researching, we're looking up different things. I actually was speaking to a research analyst at, uh, on my job and she was saying the same thing. I don't know if I can, you know, you know, buy a property and things like that. And I said, well, why not? She said, well, I don't know. I said, but you're a research analyst. Your whole profession is researching information, information and analyzing the pros and the cons. So how is this different the, um, than what you're doing for your, uh, for the government. And she said, you know what? You're right. You made a good point. And she was able to buy her first property and she's actually doing very well with it. Oh, okay. Thank you for that. You're welcome.
So we all got a mentor now, Robert. So. <laughs> <laughs> not a problem. Not a problem. <laughs> so Robert put his email address in the chat. Um, we, I, we're out of time for the night, but Robert, you're in our Facebook quick. group. I know it went quick, right? Are you in yes. our Facebook group, Robert? I think I am, but I'll double check it and make sure. All right. it, I'll make a post and tag you in it okay. so that people can ask questions underneath the post. Um, that'd be good. Or, or actually, if you can make a post in there if, you, if you're okay with that. Just oh, yeah, you, yeah, sure. yeah, just say if you have any questions for the follow up on a real estate session, just 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 ask below. And that way we can create a, a, a thread of questions that people may have. And, and we have it as a resource for everybody. Okay, and one thing I want to um, leave with everyone is, you know, everybody asks me, when is a good time to buy property now? Because everybody's waiting for the market to drop, you know, and. You, you can't do that. I know things are a little high right now, but if you look, you will find, you know, diamonds in the rough because if you're waiting for that $100,000 property to be at a discounted rate of 75, what people don't realize is as property values go down and the market drop, interest rates are going to rise as well. So what would you rather do? Buy that $75,000 property and have an interest rate. And as an investor, you, it's, interest rates are going to be before the pandemic were five, five and a half percent. Or are you going to buy that $100,000 property you know, and pay 3%? So over the life of the loan, you, you cut down on the uh, what you're paying in interest for that property versus um, buying it at, at five and a half percent. Oh, that's good insight, man. Um, so yeah, I want to continue this, this chat in the group. They want to know what's your podcast name, uh, uh, Robert. Uh, uh, actually, I can send it to you because it's through the Maryland Real Estate. So I will send yeah, that. Just, uh, post it, I, just post it in the group too. So okay, I'll do that as well. As okay. Well. And right, I can also buddy. share uh, my uh, my realtor's name as well. She's excellent as far as helping. Um, new investors find property as well. She's also uh, a HUD uh, broker as well. So if you find HUD properties as well, you know, that's a good source as well. So definitely I'll share that with everyone. Okay, yeah. If you could put that in the group, because I mean, I'm sure everybody needs that. <laughs> no doubt. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, and then we'll, we'll work some out in the first quarter of next year. We'll get you back on again. And hopefully we have sure. to, you know, from that by that time. Sure, not a problem. We can go over funding and how to fund it and, where to look and, you know, you know, what is the best loan for the properties? And, you know, one of the things that we didn't go over was, you know, step by step of, you know, once I find, how do I find a client for section? Um, you could go to, if you have a property, you can list it at go section eight.com. And that's where everybody looks to find properties who have a voucher as well. And it doesn't necessarily have to be Section 8. There's so many different voucher programs out there that people are unaware of. For instance, yeah. there's voucher programs for the House of Ruth. There's voucher programs for uh, veterans. There's so many different programs that people are just not aware of. So just don't think Section 8 is the only voucher program out there because there's there's a lot more. All right. So, Robert, we're going to have you back on sometime in the first quarter next year. So we could go into that type of stuff because I even I even want to know more about that, man. So sure, no problem. Put that in the group, and then we'll get you back on sometime in January, February, man. Anytime, anytime. Thanks, right, everyone. Brother, man, look, I really appreciate you for reaching out. Um, it, anytime. Yeah. I think this is definitely, and like you said, a lot of people are are sitting on the sidelines and they're afraid to just make that first step. Yeah. But you know, um, I, my motto is: in order to succeed, in order to you know be ahead of the game, you have to do something uncomfortable to be comfortable. Exactly. That's my motto too, man. Appreciate you, brother. At all the time. You too. All right, y'all. I appreciate you both. You. Uh, congrats. Congrats. It's, it's good to see it put in the face, man. We talked on the phone a bunch of times. I know. All the time. <laughs> you know, so, we right? have a whole, whole conversation and now we finally see each other. Yeah, see you, man. See you, Gregory, man. That's good, man. So, all right, y'all.